Some critics worry that I'm, quote, promoting cruelty and malice as instruments of political and cultural conflict, end quote, thus calling Christians to abandon civility and the biblical imperatives to love our neighbors, even our enemies, and the like. I absolutely want to dispel such concerns. No shift in context repeals these imperatives. But I think we need to think seriously through what loving our neighbor looks like in an increasingly post-Christian culture, in which there is mounting opposition to Christian ideals and profound moral confusion. I'm arguing that this context demands greater clarity, courage, and resilience. What I mean is that no matter how winsome you package it, our culture is going to hate the Bible's teachings on some of the most pressing issues of our day. So I want to conclude by quickly gesturing at what I think is needed to, in our context from two primary angles, politics and ministry. First, in regard to politics, I think we need to resist political pietism. The th winsome third-way approach often produces in its adherence a pietistic impulse to keep one's hands clean, to stay above the fray, and to reject imperfect options for addressing complex social and political issues. One of the figures who first helped me see through the limits of third wayism is Emmanuel Mounier, a mid-century French philosopher and man on the Christian left. He railed hard against the third wayism he saw in his day, saying it led to political fecklessness and foolishness. He referred to its adherents with the label paraplegics of virtue, because how they approached politics through a pietistic, moralistic lens, focusing too much on keeping their hands totally clean and ending up failing to do good for their neighbors. The view of politics I'm promoting here does not mean the ends justify the means. No, but I think we need to be clear about what the proper ends of political action are. Again, our political stances are not to be developed, articulated, and pursued primarily in view of minimizing offense so the gospel can be heard. The ends are justice and the temporal common good. As we become more clear about, about the proper ends of political action, then I think we also must think more clearly about the means available to us. And here I think we need a good dose of Christian realism. The apologetic mode of politics and forms of political pietism tend to cloud one's judgment as it pertains to determining prudential solutions to the complex problems of the temporal order. At times, for certain causes, Christians will need to collaborate with flawed figures and employ imperfect methods. Almost any successful political movement, including those for just causes, demands such. And in the negative world, to use Ren's phrase, Christians will find that they are disproportionately charged with mischief here. We need to be clear-sighted in our cultural and political battles. Christians need to know that yes, we love our enemies, but we do have enemies. Praying daily through the Psalms makes this abundantly clear. Yes, we pray for our enemies, but we admit that they exist. And related to this, we need in our political engagement, I propose, to retrieve a theology of the demonic. This is another limitation of the model I am critiquing. Third wayism often remains in the realm of ideas and worldviews. It tries to affirm the good in all sides and triangulate them by combining them somehow. My issue with this is that it doesn't sufficiently account for the spiritual and demonic realm. Some things are just evil, and there are wicked forces at play. So, we need to recognize the demonic, but with a clear caveat, without demonizing our political opponents. This is tricky and much more work needs to be done here. But some thoughts on ministry. As I said, winsomeness often translates into and reduces to niceness. But if you pay close attention to the biblical figures and just have some knowledge of church history, you know that saints and our savior were not always nice. Faithful Christians have always been willing to offend their audiences with important truths. And this is especially the case with false teachers. The New Testament is clear. False teachers are to be marked, avoided, and rebuked. In fulfilling this vocation, Christian leaders need to stand firm in the face of charges that they are being too narrow-minded or unloving or combative. And in evangelism and discipleship, Christians must resist the temptation to hide hard truths that are in clear conflict with the dominant culture. If you mute some hard teachings to get people in the door, you increase the likelihood that you will mute them indefinitely because, as A.W. Tozer says, what you win people with is what you win them to. Ultimately, this will result in a failure to sufficiently form God's people. Don't nuance away the tension with the world on the hot-button issues of our day. Don't flee from the distinct places where Satan is attacking the truths of God.